Okay, this is David Zeller, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Friday, August 19th, 2022. It is great to be back with Professor Michael Gurness. Mike, once again, it's great to be with you. Thanks, David. Yeah, it's wonderful to be here. Mike, today we're going to go back all the way to the beginning. In our first conversation, we took a great tour of your approach to the research, your institutional responsibilities, sort of a wide ranging view of all things geophysics and seismology. Today, let's start way back with your parents. Tell me about them. Oh, my parents. Okay, sure. So yeah, my parents, uh, they both were born in Massachusetts, in Eastern Massachusetts, in the south of Boston. And uh, my, my mother, she's Irish from the Dempsey clan. And uh, there's a lot of, a lot of Irish people in, uh, in Massachusetts, in the East. And, um, and so she, you know, she grew up, she's Irish, she grew up during the Great Depression. My father, he was a first generation American from Lithuania. So he, um, we think the name actually is G-I-R-N-U-S, okay? Because my father's, because my grandparents were illiterate they couldn't, you know, it didn't translate right. Um, and so his parents, my father's parents were from Lithuania and they came at about the time of uh, World War I and they, um, they fled to, so they weren't, uh, so he, the, 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 uh, John, he fled, so he wasn't conscripted into the Russian army. Um, so anyways, they came and they both grew up in, uh, in Eastern Massachusetts. And um, my father grew up on a farm and, um, and he, you know, he was 16 when Pearl Harbor happened, but um, he, he actually had a little problem with his ear. So he couldn't actually serve directly. So he ended up in the Coast Guard in the Coast Guard Reserve, then he used to defend the beaches in that way, but he also worked on the farm. And then he also uh, worked in the shipyard. He had three, he had three jobs, three, three full-time jobs. And, uh, and, and he, he did, he did that uh, well, and he worked really hard. He, and then, but he didn't start, um, Let's see, he, I don't know, what, when did he, okay. So, um, he then, uh, he was, he was a really good uh, baseball player. He was really, and he was uh, detected by a scout and he ended up being recruited by the University of Alabama, which is weird. He's a Yankee. Well, okay. I grew up in Massachusetts. He's not a Yankee because he was an immigrant. Okay. But if you're in the South, he was a Yankee, but he was recruited, right. To go to the university of, uh, uh, Alabama. And so he went down there. I'm not sure maybe in 44 or something like that. And he served on the ba uh, baseball team in his, in his senior year. So world war II finished in 1948 in the first year this class was taught in his senior year he took a class in nuclear engineering so he was getting a degree in mechanical engineering his degree is in mechanical engineering but he took this one class in nuclear the first the first year first semester it's ever taught and he gets out and comes back to massachusetts and is immediately hired um uh, in by the ship so he worked actually in the shipyard building higgins boats but then he almost is immediately back hired by the same shipbuilders and he was hired he was hired um by what was called the electric boat company i don't know if you know the whole history of the u.s naval program and building ships uh nuclear ships but anyways they were called electric boats right because they worked on electricity made by the generator. And uh, so the first thing he did is he got a job down 
and he went down to Connecticut and he he worked on the um the some of the first generation nuclear subs that were building in Groton but he wanted to he wanted to be back in Massachusetts so then he got transferred to the Quincy shipyard so that's uh and so he he did that and um I I forget I forgot now how he met my mother but she was a Quincy person with all the Irish there and so they they hooked up um and in my in the early days of my father's work right about the time that he got married or when did he get married 57 58 or something I was born in 59 he actually worked on the first nuclear surface ship the United States built. It was called the USS Bainbridge. And uh, it was launched in 1961 or 1962 in Quincy, Massachusetts. And then he... um, and there's a photograph of me in the captain's chair. <laughs> wow. <laughs> of this nuclear warship. The first one <laughs> with the captain. So my dad got this. But, uh, and then he actually worked on the USS uh, Long Beach, which was the first guided missile cruiser, also nuclear powered. Eventually, the, the, the Navy decided not to do this and whatever. But anyways, he spent his career uh, do, in working with nuclear reactors and stuff like that. So he was a really, you know, he's a depression guy, de- de- depression era guy, um, you know, very, very practical mechanical engineer. And uh, eventually I wanted to become a scientist. And he, I don't think he really understood, you know, the value of science. Like, what am I supposed to do, right? What yeah. kind of job do I supposed to get, right? Uh, you know, but in any event, and then my mother, she, she, um, you know, she grew up in, my dad grew up in a farm. So he, you know, he, that was a fine, tough, but good life in Massachusetts. And my mother grew up in a very large poverty stricken Irish family. Um, but some, she dropped out, but somehow she, got a full scholarship to go to Harvard, but she somehow, it all came to pieces after the first year, something like that. It was, uh, but- She never finished event, her degree. So she dropped out, she dropped, She never got a degree. Yeah, and that was actually, see my mother loved books. She loved learning. And um, so she, she was, um, you know, so like books were everywhere if you wanted to read or do anything. So yeah, going to college, all of us, there were four of us, you know, we're all baby boomers. So there's a big family. Uh, and so, yeah, so we're all going to go to college. And my father, you know, brought us down to a small town in uh, in Eastern Massachusetts on the South Shore. There's a lot of wealthy people live there, but of course we were just... Uh, just middle class folks uh and uh but yeah so i had a brother and then two sisters yeah um yeah and it was wonderful growing up you know it, even though it was the suburbs and i think this had a played a real it had a huge influence on me as i grew up uh for some i mean i just i just love the um it was just right next to the ocean and those beautiful spot you could imagine right we didn't live on the beach, right? Is you have to be a millionaire to live down there, but we lived on a hill and we could actually see the water. And I just loved, you know, have all these forests and woods and um, growing up with my friends, you know, would run around in the woods and along the ocean and explore and things like that. So it was just an incredible, incredible time to, uh, to grow up, you know, like many, baby boomers our parents couldn't care less what we did right yeah. we spent the whole day outside and uh you know maybe you reported back at the end of the day and if you didn't get in any trouble what happened but yeah so anyways it was uh yeah 
Are those some of the things that you are looking for? Absolutely. Mike, what kind of schools did you go to growing up? Public schools. And even though we grew up in a, you know, again, it was, this is the thing about a town of 7,000 people. There were people who lived in, you know, there's laborers, you know, who have, you know, things that just houses in disrepair. Then there were the clearly the middle people in the middle who my father built the house, had the house built. And then, but then there was all this old money, holy mackerel. And because uh, I worked, I always worked. Since I was 13 years old, I worked and I had my own, um, uh, you know, I wouldn't call, I would not sure if I, I didn't at the time view it as a business, but in some sense it was like a business. And I did everyone's yards and their lawns and things like that. And I just did this after school most days, a little bit on the weekends. And so I, I uh, was always, was working and everyone worked at that time. You were the worst <laughs> insult that you could ever get hailed at you back then. You'd be walking down the street and a car would go by and <laughs> they would yell out at you, get a job. You know, it's like, <laughs> what the hell are you walking around for? You should be working, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, everyone, that was the ethic, you know? So even, you know, my parents, you know, uh, you know, my father was saving up for me to go to college and my two sisters and my brother and stuff like that. But by the same token, you know, everyone was expected still to work and, uh, and save and save money. Right. And my parents grew up in the great depression. So we had to save money all the time. So, um, so yeah, it was, it was good. I went to public schools and, uh, they were good schools, right? They were really good schools. It was a, it was a elementary school and a middle school and then a combined uh, uh, junior high, which is seventh and eighth grade and then and then high school. And um, now I was so interested in science. I just I mean, I don't know what when it was or what it was or whatever it was. I mean, I because I even remember in the middle school, right? I remember we had a science class, right, in the sixth grade, and I just couldn't wait until I was going to be able to 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 do that kind of stuff, go to actually, you know, in in a in a classroom they would actually talk about science. Um, but I remember we even had a science fair, right, in the fifth of the sixth grade, and I would. I didn't do very well in that, um, in the sense I know I built a whole bunch of airplanes, um, model airplanes, um, but it wasn't anything, you know, clever or anything like that, because I got, had no guidance or anything like that, right? But I, I knew I was very, very interested in that. Um, and then so I never, so I would just tinker all the time with science myself, with I had a telescope and built a telescope. I had a chemistry experiment and didn't burn the house down. And, and, um, but I also had my own projects, right? And uh, so even though my high school had nothing organized, right? Um, I participated remotely in these, in some things, right? And there was some, um, I did some, ones that were more like planetary science based. I did some planetary science based ones where I would, I had several different projects where I would order these photographs from NASA, right? And it, and it was kind of cool because, well, I had my own money because I worked, right? And I could, I actually had enough money that I could actually send away and like order these photographs and I could order them through like these digital repositories. They, because right from day one, NASA would this. And you got to sort of figure it out. You got to write lots of letters, right? All either typewritten ones or handwritten. And then they'll send you this crap and you figure it out. There's no internet or anything like that. And you go through all these manuals and you figure out and get all this data set, right? And you can order things, right? You could actually order, you know, the photographs of the planetary surfaces. And so I worked on cratering um, and I did, I submitted it into several like regional science fairs and I would actually do 
quite well. Um, and I even won this, uh, like, I don't know if it was a sophomore in high school, there was this Boston University put on some sort of a competition in astronomy. And I was like a, uh, he's a third prize or honorable mention or something like that. I don't know what it was. And uh, it was a kind of a low level kind of a thing. But then, you know, I kept working on, I did all this by myself, right? And I didn't have any help whatsoever from the science, the, the science teachers or anything. This was all done independently. I did everything independently, right? You know, my parents knew I was doing all this, right? You know, and I'd mentioned this to, you know, friends and stuff like that. And, and there's, Mike, there's no internet. You can't Google anything either. Are you kidding me? There's no Google. <laughs> I, I was very good at the mail. Right. And that's why NASA was so incredible. Right. Because everything was dirt cheap, even on the, my budget, you know, from all my savings accounts. I still had money. I could if I wanted to buy these things, just buy them. You know, you'd, you'd order a particular frame and they would make a print, you know, eight and a half by 11. But, you know, with my telescope, I even started to make uh, photographs of the moon in different colors and stuff like that. Um, and combine them up and stuff like that. It's a very common technique in remote sensing where they photograph like the earth or the planets or whatever in different colors. And I try to experiment with these kinds of myself. I mean, I don't think there was anything really brilliant about it to be honest with you, but at least I did it all by myself and I tried to build everything myself, put everything together myself. And then in my senior year, I submitted, I, I, it's called, um, well, it's called the Science Talent Search. I don't know if you ever heard of this. Yes. Okay. So anyways, it used to be supported by this company called Westinghouse. Mm -hmm. They used to make nuclear reactors and you know, dishwashers and stuff like that. But in any event, they now actually it's, um, uh, yeah, because uh, I correspond a little bit with the president of, um, of the science, corporate, I forget what it's called now. But um, but any event, so I was bold enough and I submitted my application, my project to this in the beginning of my, I guess, in my senior year. Right. And, uh, you know, I didn't had no help from anyone. Right. Zero from school. My parents knew what I was doing. Right. They knew I was just busy as a beaver, you know, working away. I wasn't playing with my friends or with, uh, you know, working on my own job. I was there, you know, studying, working on these, uh, this stuff all by myself. And I submitted it and I ended up being one of the top 40 in that particular year in 1977 or 1978, Jimmy Carter was president. And I said, holy smoke, you know, and, and then all of a sudden I got, I was a senior in high school, right? And uh, still barely any acknowledgement. And it was never really acknowledged by my high school, interestingly enough. And I was selected and I went to Washington as far as the, in the group of 40, I was one of the winners, right? And, uh, and that was uh, an eye-opening experience because one of the things I realized when I went to the, went to that is that, um, well, for, they, were, they all seemed way smarter than I was, but then everyone else was in a program. There was this um, high school in New York City, okay? It's spelled in a funny way. It's um, Stevenson, no, uh, St uh, do you know the high school I'm talking about? Stuyvesant? Stuyvesant. You know, there was like three Stevenson ones and like four from the Bronx High School of Science, right? There was at least four, 10 kids in the 40 from New York City, right? And they were there from this high school or they're from the Bronx High School of Science, right? And then there was, a, you know, and, um, and these, all these other people, they had all this stuff in their high school and all these mentors, right? That's one thing I realized. And I had no one, right? I, I just, I felt it totally out of, I told, totally out of water. I mean, a fish out of water, you know? It's like, holy mac, what am I doing here? I have no idea what I'm doing here. But, um, you know, and it was kind of cool. 
I got to meet some interesting people. I got to meet Frank Press. I don't know if you knew who Frank Press was. Absolutely. Yeah. Did that leave an impression on you? Did that make a mark? It you did. Think? He totally, he totally torpedoed my project at the National Academy. <laughs> and I never brought it up because I, later in life, I got to meet Frank. Um, and so he, and maybe I brought this up. I mean, I don't, I don't think I said, I was very polite to him. I didn't think I said, oh, you didn't. He just didn't say, I mean, I was talking about some things. I, I talked about these color differences on the moon, right? And I said that there were these different color differences that one can see between blue and red uh, on this. And I thought that it was this large geological structure that hadn't yet been identified. Um, but anyways, it hadn't been talked about. And he said, I never heard of that. Okay, so wonderful, okay. <laughs> But in any event, I, uh, uh, yeah, and most people, you know, I, I didn't know what they were talking about. They were almost all chemists and stuff like that. There was this guy, Glenn Seaborg, see, I think that was his name. Yeah, Glenn Seaborg, sure. Yeah, he, he discovered the, uh, what isotope, um, Seaborg, you know, <laughs> I forget what, what he did. He... Yeah, it wasn't tritium because that was Harold Urey. Uh, and it was cesium, cobalt. He, he looked yeah. at a lot of them. Yeah. Anyways, I got to meet him. Um, I got to go to the National Academy of Sciences. I uh, And guess because Jimmy Carter was president, the first time ever the group of the Science Talent Search winners were invited to the White House. <laughs> so we got to go walked from our hotel uh, through to the White House. And it is probably the most memorable experience of my entire life because what happened on that morning, in fact, I looked all this up, you know, now that everything's on the internet, you can look up. So this is 1978, the United States is in the middle of this massive coal strike. And uh, and so we're reaching this point that industrial production is starting to come down. And there's this, all this rumors that the president is gonna invoke this act to make all the coal miners go back to work, right? So we then walk across Lafayette Square and then it's, it's a fortress. I have never seen, I mean, I've been to the White House. I mean, I'm not in it since, but I've been around the White House and all that whole area, I know it very, very well. But, um, and I, I've seen a lot of police and I've seen a lot of armed people there, but I never saw anything close to this because they were so worried that the coal miners would violently react. They just, threw up so much. I just couldn't believe what they th threw up in terms of horse police. This is phalanxes of these police on horses, streets with hundreds and hundreds of police cars. There was no one else, just the police and armed guards and everywhere. And so we mar we walked our way through all of this stuff, right? And we made our way into the West Wing um, and got in there. And then we went into this room, right? And then they were there and different people get up there. Frank Press is probably the one introducing us. Glenn is up there, you know? And then all of a sudden it got really, really, really quiet. Everyone's quiet. We're in this room. I forget what room it is. And then suddenly Frank, then Jimmy Carter comes through the door, right? And I, it was like an explosion in there, right? Of the, of the flash bulbs. And the cameras, I had never heard anything like this in my entire life in this house. We went from this dead quiet to this just, you know, it was like the 4th of July, like, <laughs> right? And the room just exploded in light, you know, and it was weird. And the reason it wasn't, had nothing to do with us or it had nothing to do with Jimmy Carter, except what had just literally happened in the White House is that literally one minute before all of this happened, he invoked what was called the Taft-Harding Act. And basically it's almost, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very martial imperial thing. And he basically can order certain businesses back to work, period, or you're arrested, right? 
And so that was, it was the most uh, sort of aggressive thing he had done in his presidency up to that point in time. And so it was, it was a very worthy event, nothing to do with us. We were just there, right? That we probably not even mentioned in the newspaper, right? Because he, because full page, you know, we then got back to our hotel rooms, could see the big headlines, what had happened, right? Anyways, then I'm in the front row, and he's coming along, and he's coming along. We all have names, baggage, and it's so cool. He takes my hand and he shakes me, and he goes, "Thank you, Michael, for your contributions." So, I'm, oh my God! But it was weird because when he when he takes your hand, right, and it's like it was like no shake hands with people all the time you know you but it was like nothing there right it was the most limp you know, it was a limp handshake it was so limp i never could believe anyone could be so limp in my life <laughs> <laughs> anyways yeah so then um yeah and then i later discovered that you can discover you can read about all this stuff on the uh the internet you just download the minute by minute events that the president does, right? And we can then see where what all the events were happening, what what room we were in, what what he just did, and all that kind. Of, anyways, that was a very. Uh, anyways, it's just exciting. I don't have very much opportunity to. I haven't told this story for, for probably. I told my wife a couple times. She probably doesn't want to hear it again. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I got it. Mike, between your mom's Irish heritage and your father's Lithuanian heritage, did you? They were any... Catholic too, by the way. I was going to ask what what kind of cultural traditions did you have in your family growing up? I would say, you know, it was definitely not overly Catholic, right? You know, I did go to church, and everyone went to church, and I but I stopped. Uh, luckily, I mean, after several years, my mother gave up on me when I, you know, after, you know, several years of me just telling her God doesn't exist. We came from the Big Bang. And this is like over and over and over again. You know, we came we, it's evolution. This is just it's hogwash. It's crap. It's garbage, you know, and uh, and she's smart. Right. So she knew she knew. You know, there were these other views out there. She went to college and uh, she read all the time. So she, you know, knew. I mean, I probably had the strongest views in the house about, you know, atheist views and not. But, you know, no one, she never gave me a heart. No one, no one, you know, you know, would say you're going to go to hell or anything like that. They weren't like that. They were not, there were, no one was oppressively religious or anything like that. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, there's a there's a lot of Irish Catholic around, but uh, but no, it was sort of middle of the road. Education was really really important. Um, sports was important, you know. Um, frugalness, um, out outdoors was really important. Yeah, and I don't know if it it became very important uh, the way the outlook on my siblings and myself interestingly enough and 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 what my dad would do is uh he always thought vacations should be camping right so he would take us up to primarily new hampshire and then every alternative year it would be something further afield right maine or nova scotia or canada but primarily it was New Hampshire and the mountains and camping and things like that. And so I developed, even at a very young age, this appreciation of the outside and walking. And my brother did too, right? Uh, I think my brother, who was older than me by two years, he he was like this. Um, my sisters were more, so we were, my brother and I were more, you know, he was more of a thinker. We were more thinker, out, outdoor type people. But my, but my, I mean, what my older of the two sisters. So the next one below, I was the second. I had a, the next one below me with my sister. Interestingly enough, I mean, she became a quite accomplished sailor when she was in high school. Interestingly enough, and she was in the national championship and. Uh, 
she w she crewed with a guy her same age, and they came out here to San Diego from Massachusetts to compete in some national competition. Um, and my my youngest sister, she was the real she was a real sports fanatic, uh, and so yeah, I mean, I would I would say it's uh, it was way more. I mean, we were more bookish and scholastic. I think in your typical type people um, despite the working class roots yeah despite the working class roots right and a lot of that has to do with my my mother i i really believe and then the fact is that my you know my father had this cutting edge then the word high tech didn't exist back then but you know he was at the cutting edge of uh of technology right so um so because of that you know and he just sort of got into it right he was practical and the country needed a lot of engineers during the war and after the war, and he got into one of the coolest subjects. And you know, my mother was really smart, and she, you know, could have done a lot. And so she always wanted us to succeed and to do study and book learning and stuff like that. I think because she, I think, you know, my mother wanted, you know, because she because what she couldn't achieve her herself, right? I think she wanted her kids to, you know, going to college. I mean, it was just like nothing was ever, that was it, right? And everyone went to college, right? Some of us went further and other. I mean, eventually my brother became a, a teacher, right? And he's married. My brother lives in Maine and his, his wife is the headmaster of one of the big private schools in the state of Maine, right? one of the big academies and she's been a headmaster in other schools in the country. So she, you know, you know, and he wrote poetry and he got a master's degree. And so clearly there was this, because of my mother, this very, very, you know, reading books and stuff like that. I mean, there was lots and lots of books and we had the world book encyclopedia and I went through every, I don't have a good memory. Uh, I had a way better memory back then, but I looked at every single page and all of those, you know, 5,000 pages, right? And all of a sudden at dinner time, something would come up and I would say, you know, what the capital was or what the principal product of a country was or something like that. And where does he know that stuff from? Well, there's the world book. You just start in A in the first page and then there's Z, you know, 5,000 pages later. And I didn't, you know, you would read, oh, that's an interesting article. And now that's not interesting. This one's interesting. All these pictures, and bigger captions. And so, yeah, I mean, and that was great, you know, and, um, and I, I think a lot of it had to do with my mother. Yeah. Mike, when it was time in high school to start thinking about colleges between geography, family finances, your grades, what was in range? What kinds of schools did you think you could get into? Well, Mike Ray, I was not the best student, it turns out. So I studied hard, but I also goofed off with all these other things. So I was a goof off in the sense that, um, you know, I would, all my little projects, I would spend as much time on, right? So because of that, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna get into Harvard, right? That's what everyone talked about. I gotta go to Harvard, my, not at our family, right? No one ever said that, never. Right. But, you know, kids in the school and the neighborhood would go to Harvard and stuff like that. And, and so it had to be something that's more a good school academically and that's more type in the middle. Right. Like a Boston so I went College. to the universe. I went to the University of Rochester for one year and despised it. Right. I hated it. All the people from New York there. So I wanted to get out of there. And so I went to the University of Arizona. Um, and I, you know, I knew it was out west, right? And uh, I knew Arizona was a big place because of astronomy and planetary science. And so I knew that was a that was a thing to do, right? So I went. I then, on my own accord, I just up and went to the University of Arizona. Didn't really consult too much with my parents about it because I was away in in New York and again, just writing away <laughs> or getting stuff in the mail and corresponding and, and, and things like that. Uh, 
And actually, in that year, I had a very close friend. He went to the University of Arizona as well, but he went there as a freshman. I went there as a transfer student, as a as a sophomore. Um, and so, and I think a lot. I mean, part of the reason is, um, I mean, I saw the bill from the University of Rochester, and I and I said, I don't know about this, you know. Uh, and it, this is just unbelievably expensive. And uh, my dad seemed to be willing and we got some loans out and he would pay and they paid in the first year. But then we went, I went to the University of Arizona and, uh, and there I was determined to do everything myself, right? My dad paid maybe for one or two, maybe the first semester or something like that. And I got just a couple of other, and then for the rest, I got loans, right? Or may I forget, maybe the equation, and they weren't very much, right? This was back in the late, I started in 1979 there. And so the tuition wasn't super gigantic. And I would get these loans that were underwritten from the government. And then I worked immediately. I started to uh, work and within, six months or something like that. I had hooked up with these faculty members in this place called the Lunar and Planetary Lab. I wanted to do planetary science. I absolutely wanted to do planetary science. When I did my project with the Westinghouse Science Talent Search, I wanted to do planetary science. And I thought it was so cool because it was this geology, but then it was astronomy at the same time. And so I wanted to do this. And I think that was the draw from the University of Arizona. And so up until a few years ago, the, there was just two places in the country that walked on water in planetary science. And one was Caltech and the other was the University of Arizona. And, uh, and they built this lab right there. Of course, Caltech built JPL. But they built this Lunar and Planetary Lab, which is really one of the top programs in planetary science. I don't know if you know anything about it. Sure. Yeah. And uh, there was this guy, actually, and I never met him. He died before I was there. Um, his name was uh, Gerhardt. No. What's his first name? Anyway, he's Kuiper, right? Like the Kuiper belt, stuff like that. You know about the Kuiper belt. Sure. Oh, Mike Brown's work. So there was this guy called Kuiper. He was a Dutch man, he was an astronomer, and he was an oddity because he wanted to do planetary science. And he built this thing at the University of Arizona. And he built this big interdisciplinary team. And they were, and, um, and I knew about one of the guys, it was kind of funny. There was this guy, he was an old man, even at the time, his name was Ewan Whitaker. And, uh, and I knew about his research uh, because when I did my Westinghouse thing, I sort of followed his papers, right? He was doing this kind of like remote sensing and uh, you only could do it for the moon, right? Because it was that was the only big thing we could see, right? It was a big enough disc. And, um, and so I learned about him and I corresponded with him by letters and, uh, and, and you know, so I had a little open door. And so, um, and he was a pro, he was an old man at the time, he was Scottish and he was a protege of, of Kuiper, right? He was one of the first people that Kuiper brought in to help him do all these fantastic things with the moon on uh, taking lunar, lunar photographs and things like this. And, um, but then once I, uh, I got there and I was talking, spending a lot of time uh, working, uh, talking with uh, Ewan Whitaker, you know, he, he really was in the team of a you know one of these guys with a with a research group his and his name was uh robert strom s t r o m and he he became quite prominent uh because he sort of led all of the interpretation of the photographs of mercury right and then later and later in life uh he in fact may have been the the top scientist on the on uh, what, what, what the, whatever the Mercury probe was. Any event, I got to work in Bob Strom's team, right? And uh, well, I was this industrial 
industrial guy, right? I mean, I was just, you know, I just worked hard and, and, and worked. And those guys just took me totally under the wing and they hired me. I mean, I almost seemed like I worked full time for these guys. And I published a whole bunch of papers with them. And um, back in, in about 1980-ish time. And, uh, but in any event, because of that, between working full time um, with these guys and then getting these loans, I put myself to college. Um, and, um, but what happened along the way, guess what happened? I started again, just keep, kept reading. And there's two things that were going on that had a big influence on my career. One was just, and I started to read in geophysics. Well, how did I get to geophysics, right? This is kind of interesting uh, because, well, I figured that if you're gonna become a planetary scientist, well, you gotta be a physicist. Well, what better way to get this background that was traditional and that was solidly fundamental that would be a good background for planetary science like geophysics right and so i just pursued this geophysics degree and then suddenly became totally fascinated by it right but simultaneously i was beavering away with in bob strom's group and these guys were such a downer because what was happening, this is like from 1980 to 1982, suddenly the budget, the NASA budget, instead of, and the planetary budget, instead of doing the going up like this, it was going down, right? And they were getting fewer emissions and everyone's got to fight. These guys were still loaded with money compared to we are today, right? But yet, these guys said, oh, where is it going? Where is planetary science going? Where blah, 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 blah. And so this really had a negative impact. And then I was doing all this reading in geophysics and says, holy mackerel, the Earth is an inc I was already fascinated by the Earth. I was fascinated by, starting to get fascinated by physics and applied math. And I said, wow, this is cool. That's the direction I want to go, right? And then so I made it made, I have wrote all these papers, you can see it on my resume in planetary science, and then I just dumped it. And um, I, uh, I, um, and I was trying to figure out what to do. And what I was, I was working with this guy, his name was Alex Warno. And Alex was uh, in Bob Strom's team, right? And he was like a senior scientist, he was really smart. And he he was like a, he was a compute guy, right? He did all his work by computer simulation, right? And so I, I you know, I have this single authored paper as an undergraduate and I developed all my own Monte Carlo models and analyzed images of Mars. But in any event, I, I, um, I, it's just the whole idea of using a computer to to look at these complex physical systems just fascinated me, right? And then I just started to figure in, well, I was interested in geophysics and the earth, and I'm interested in these computers, what should I do, right? And so I started to read papers and books and talk to people about two topics one was the subject I went into, which was called mantle convection. But the other one was about climate change and post-glacial rebound, right? And I was really fascinated by this whole area of thinking about that the Earth was changing its orbital configuration, causing climate change. And then the ice caps came and went. I says, well, that, that could be really, really interesting. And I knew that there had been work that had been done on Mars on the same topic. And, uh, you know, and I started this, you know, in books and papers, I could see this keeling curve, right? Of sea level it says, well, man, when I'm old and dead, this world is going to be really in tough shape. But thank goodness this is all going to happen after when I'm dead. So I did not see the urgency 
in 1981 when I was making these decisions about going in the direction of the climate, which is one of the two things I was going to do. And instead, I was going to go in the direction of mantle convection because several years before plate tectonics was discovered and this area looked like it was taking off, this area of trying to understand what the physics of the Earth's interior was. Um, and so, so that's what happened. It was kind of funny. You know, you'd think I would have pursued a planetary science degree. In fact, it probably would have been very successful for me because I was right there in an early stage and, um, and it eventually just totally turned around and it's taken over the world. It's gonna take the GPS division over. <laughs> um, and, and Mike, when, when exactly does seismology enter the scene for you? Is it as an undergraduate at Arizona or that's later? No, I did, I knew, I started, I took classes. The seismology class was not taught in the year I want, needed to take it in. And, uh, oh yeah, in some areas of geophysics, my classmates pissed me off royally. All my classmates were master's students, right? Those were all the people who were getting in the same physics and math. They were primarily, they were physics, math, and geophysics courses, where it seemed like we're all in the same classes. And um, they did it because they're all interested in going into the oil industry, right? And I was so anti, uh, I later actually worked, did a lot of work in the oil, in, with oil companies. But at that time, I was really, I was um, like the outdoors, I like hiking, and I viewed that, well, you know, there's got to be this thing called climate change eventually. And uh, the oil industry was destroying everything, right? Uh, they were doing all this drilling. And, you know, I grew up, uh, I didn't grow up, pardon me. I was at the time in Arizona, there was this guy called uh, Edward Abbey, mm -hmm. the monkey wrench gang. So I got to go to a, uh, a, uh, a, uh, a rally with him. No, he led it, right? Uh, and it was the anti uh, Ronald Reagan. There was this guy called Watt Watts. He was the Secretary of the Interior, and he came to Tucson, and um, we had a big uh, demonstration. But anyway, so I was so anti oil company, right? But all my classmates, they all they wanted. This was 1982. Finally, the way to get us out of the whole oil business, the oil crunch, you know, that started in 73 and just up year, this year, that year, blah, blah. The, there's so much activity in the oil business. And eventually this, be, in the year I graduated, the top job in the country was a petroleum engineer. And the second one was like a geophysicist, right? And so I was so anti this, right? But I was fascinated so this is the whole thing. These people wanted to get the get the education, to get the job, and and I was getting retaking the same classes, and I was mesmerized by the physics classes and the math classes and how it all connected together. I just started to see, at the same time that this geophysics was happening, I could see how. I mean, probably this is epiphany. Is your degree in, in science or in physics? In neither one, history, history of science. Oh, history, history of science, okay. But in any event, there's this big, you know, once you, you know, this whole way that physics and partial differential equations and applied math all kind of like merge together, right? And you can't really see it all until you've taken a lot of different things. And then you, you reach this point, it's like a, an epiphany. And at this time in 1981, I just saw this and I said, whoa, and I wanted to go into a field where I could do this kind of stuff, but yet do something about the earth and uh, in a computer modeling. And so that's why I pursued this direction of mantle convection. And, uh, but anyways, I was still a troublemaker because I spent all this time writing these papers as an undergraduate. And then, so I didn't have a good undergraduate to, I didn't have a good undergraduate resume either. So it was like, holy mackerel, what am I doing? It was like, just keep repeating myself, you know, taking this uh, direction that just doesn't seem to work out. Um, but in any event, so it's so funny what happened then 
is uh, there was a geophysics faculty members and I had an advisor at the University of Arizona. His name was Randy Richardson. And interestingly enough, he actually did computer modeling uh, and mechanics and things like that. Um, he had just gotten his degree a couple of years beforehand from MIT. Um, he was a student of this guy called Sean Solomon. I'm not sure if you've crossed paths with Sean. Mm -hmm. he, he eventually became director of Lamont. But uh, anyways, Randy was a student of Sean. And, um, but, uh, but anyways, Randy said, man, you're, you're a troublemaker, man. Uh, you, we got to send you to another troublemaker. And so he sent me, you, you gotta, you got you gotta go and work with this guy. His name was Jeff Davies and he was a geophysicist, a recent Caltech graduate, but he was at this university called Washington University in St. Louis. And so I was corresponding with Jeff, right? Because uh, he was exactly in the field I wanted to be in. And, and, and uh, Randy said, you guys are going to hit it off. You go work with him. And, um, and so we're corresponding. We're on the telephone. And then, and then Jeff says to me, so here I am. I'm an undergraduate. He doesn't know at the University of Arizona, right? And, um, and, he, and he tells me on the phone, he goes, Mike, can you keep a secret, right? Well, most people, a lot of people can't keep secrets, right? And, uh, and he says, you got to keep it a secret. Um, but if you come here and work with me, I'm going to leave. And I'm going to go to the Australian National University. I was waiting for this. How you got to Australia? Now, interestingly enough, I knew about this school. I couldn't believe Jeff told me this because I was reading this book. It was called, oh, wow, The Composition of the Earth or something. The Composition, and it was, it was, it was, um, it was written by this, not by a physicist, but by a petrologist. His name was Ringwood. R I N G W O O D and his uh, A E Ringwood, okay, Ted Ringwood, and he was really famous earth scientist uh, in Australia, and there was this institute there. It was an institute for advanced study at the Australian National University, and they were in this place called the Research School of Earth Sciences, and then so I corresponded with them. And so, wow, this is fast. They have geophysics too, right? And they wrote back all this material. And uh, and then suddenly I got a right to, it was really ambiguous how to go to graduate school there, right? I said, this this looks really cool. They're doing all the thing I'm interested in. And, and I didn't know much about Australia. And, um, and uh, but they said, well, that would be an interesting place to go. Maybe I should think I should go there. And, uh, but yet I don't really know how to apply. It said, well, you should just write to a professor. Well, I should have, except the ones in geophysics, I really didn't like their research in, right? And, but I was drawn more by this other guy, Ringwood, who I later became an enemy with, or he became an enemy of mine, or he became an enemy, I'll tell you about Ted. Whoa, he was one of the most controversial figures. He was a brilliant, brilliant scientist. But in any event, so Jeff then tells me, I'm going to go to the Australian National University and you can come and you got to keep it a secret. OK, so then then we we finished up the stuff with Wash U. They admitted me and they gave me this, even though I didn't do very well. They gave me their this top fellowship. Uh, I got paid more than the other students that was named and everything. They, there was only had one of them. So, whoa, I'll go. And uh, and I got to work with Jeff, and I totally kept this a secret. He immediately we started to work together and, and worked very well. And of course, he is extremely independent and did, did his own stuff. And he would just let me be independent and, I, and work on. I get help from him, and it bounces ideas back, back, back. And then, of course, halfway through the first halfway through the year, right, of being there in St. Louis. Uh, you know, Jeff tells me, you know, uh, you know, I got this offer, so you're going to hear around in the department that I'm going to be leaving. 
are you still interested in going to Australia? He says, you bet. I still didn't know anything about Australia, by the way, interesting enough. And, uh, um, and so, yeah, that's fine. So they put all the graduate students in one, the first year students in one big room, right? I'm studying away, working hard in there. And then all of a sudden the door opens and all the graduate students come in roaring, Hey, Mike, don't you know Jeff's leaving? You're, you know, it's like, you know, it's like uh, suddenly the whole department's in an uproar because their star faculty member is suddenly leaving the department, right? And suddenly, what are you going to, what am I, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And I said, well, I don't know. <laughs> and so I, that's how I ended up going to the, to the AMU. And I loved it. It was, that place uh, was in its golden age when I, when I went there. And it was a totally, it was like a self-contained institute, right? They had so much money that it was beyond for earth science. So they had, um, so all, you know, no one, you didn't write grants or anything. You just went there and everything was covered. And, um, and uh, like all the people who did mass spectrometry or did field geophysics, I mean, it was like they, it, they built all of the top instruments for mass spectrometry in the world. They eventually, and even when I was a graduate student there, they got so far ahead of the curve that, that no one could even approach them. And they were dating the oldest ages of the, the oldest aged rocks on the world. They were doing all these other high pressure experiments in Ted Ringwood's lab. And they're doing all this field geophysics and field seismology. And how did I get involved with seismology? Well, it happened then at that time. And it was a kind of a weird, it just happened over a short period of time. And then my connection to Caltech happened. Um, so it happened is, first is that, you know, we're working on plate tectonics. This is the, and then Jeff, we're having this discussion. It says, Jeff goes to you, Mike, you don't know much about plate tectonics, do you? And, um, and so he, or seismology, right? Of course, he's a seismology degree from Caltech. And then he comes and he gave me this book. Well, first you start reading this book, right? And actually it was written by this guy called Bruce, Bruce Bolt. And it was more like a monograph for, um, you know, for scientists, but it wasn't a, a technical, a super technical one. I was reading this book. I got to this whole section about the interior of the earth and the narrative that this guy then portrayed it says, holy mackerel. Um, he was talking about seismic waves piercing into the interior of the earth and being used by a, as a remote sensing technique. And you'd be almost like a detective with this wave going down and seeing the unseen as a detective, right? And the, just the way he wrote about this, he says, oh, this is incredible. And then simultaneously with this, there was a group here at Cal in the Seismo Lab was Don Helmberger, who later in my career, we became very close together scientifically. And one of his students, Thorne Lay, who became very prominent. He's just a couple years older than I am. Uh, he's very prominent in the field. And so Don and Thorne wrote this paper um, and they had discovered this new part of the deep interior and they, it had already been named, but finally they, they put some clues to it and it was called D double prime. But this paper they wrote, I mean, mostly I wasn't yet excited by earthquakes and seismic waves, but then suddenly this paper that Lay and Helmberger wrote was the same couple of weeks and month. I had just written this, wrote, read this book about this detective story and I could see this and suddenly it was like, oh my God, this is all incredible. Because we didn't know what this layer was that uh, Helmberger and Lay had discovered. They thought it was the crust, right? And then so we then started to write papers and work on this problem like right away. And uh, and we basically it was like continents, except we put them on the bottom of the mantle. Right. And and in fact, Jeff and I almost <laughs> were going to write in in this that we we're going to call it the anti-crust. Right. And we said, oh, no, we better not call it the anti-crust because the religious fanatics will think it's called the anti-Christ, you know. <laughs> but um and basically it was like, we argued that they were like the opposite of continents. Well, later I, we determined that this model was totally wrong, 
But any event, it was, this is, then I just, with Earth's structure, then suddenly just became fascinated by this and became fascinated by Caltech because suddenly I realized that all the discoveries of the interior of the Earth, they all, every single one of them pointed to one place, which was here, right? And then, so then all of it, all I wanted to do once I was finishing my degree was to come to Caltech. And um, so then what happened is uh, Jeff was an alumni and there was a whole bunch of other people in, in, at the ANU who were from either the division uh, or they came from the Seismal Lab, right? And so there was this very, very strong connection. Uh, and then so then, you know, when I decided to become a postdoc, uh, I got a lot of offers, but there was only one place I wanted to come, which was here. Um, and so, yeah, and then so it was, uh, yeah, I mean, all the, um, you know, even the people who I thought I was like doing intellectual battle with, which is this gentleman, uh, Don Anderson, you know, in reality, it, a lot of it was really because of his, because of his ideas, even though I disagreed with him and what he had done with students here at Caltech, uh, you know, just helped the debate, right? This is the whole, this is the great thing about the, the academic discourse. The great thing about the Seismal Lab is all, even when you have contrarian views, right? The best thing to do is to get in a room and discuss and and, and compete with one another, right? And uh, yeah, and Don was always incredibly supportive of me, even though I was advancing, uh, you know, a vision of the Earth's interior which was very different from his own, right? He was always supportive when I first came here and talking with me and sending me off into different directions were very, were very helpful. Yeah. Mike, before we leave Australia at ANU, tell me a little bit more intellectually how you developed your, your dissertation topic. Well, this was fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it. one of the things that uh, was happening at this time, well, the big debate that started here at Caltech and other places in the 1970s, largely because of Don Anderson here in the Seismo Lab, the students, but also here because of geochemistry at Caltech, that uh, there was this view of the interior of the Earth that uh, that the that the whole interior of the Earth was stratified. So we have plate tectonics, we have subduction, but then we have this region, the upper mantle, all the way down to the transition zone down to 660. And then below that, we have no earthquakes. That's the lower mantle. It's the largest part of the earth by volume. And um, so this debate between upper mantle convection and whole mantle convection. So either there was this strict layering at 660, right? Or there was not, right? And we had these two different modes. In fact, that was the big holy grail of geophysics was between upper mantle and whole mantle convection. And Jeff was on one side of this. He was on, he was on Jeff Davies and uh, Tom Jordan here at USC, another very prominent seismic lab graduate was on one side of the debate, the whole mantle convection debate. But 95% of the community and all the geochemists were on the layered convection side. And most of the physicists were also on the layered convection side. But there was a lot of stuff that just didn't piece together, right? And Jeff then started to formulate the hypothesis that you can reinterpret the geochemistry in terms of whole mantle convection. And, but it required one to put this on a, on a physics basis on understanding how convection would work and how geochemical uh, anomalies would be transported in the mantle, right? So, and so then I developed the basis, the fluid dynamic basis and the geophysical basis by which to do that. And so that was specifically my thesis topic was to bridge this gap of taking the whole mantle model and seeing if I can connect it with geochemistry, right? So there's a whole slew of, of different studies I did under the mentorship of Jeff uh, and of trying to interpret the earth in terms of the whole mantle of convection. Now it was still, even by the time I, uh, by the time I finished my thesis, 
Uh, I finished it in 86, came to Caltech in 86, although my degree didn't come until 1987. Um, um, and so, but still the, the flavor had definitely still within layered convection, right? But I sort of mostly gave up that, that, that I mean, I stopped that immediately and started to work on other topics. Um, but um, that was the that was the topic, and the, and eventually got resolved, and it got resolved by Seismolab, primarily by I think the best work was done by a Seismolab graduate, Steve Grant, and he's a professor of geophysics at the University of Texas. But you could see it in his PhD thesis here; he could just see the all of the plates. You can just see them returned very clearly down to the interior of of the lower mantle, right? Just like Jeff's model. So Jeff was vindicated uh, by the seismologist in a famous paper that was written in 1980, no, part 1990, yeah, 1990, shoot, I forget, it's right there in the mid 1990s, right? Um, and Steve Grant co-authored it with uh, Rob Vanderhilst, uh, came from a different uh, academic tree than Caltech but um he and they and that sort of like was the sort of like the nail in the coffin um but anyways yeah that's what happened that's uh um yeah yeah Mike I'm so, curious in graduate school were you following any of the debates and some of the optimism about earthquake prediction that was happening no, none at all. Zero. I was not at all familiar with this. In fact, I keep learning things. Lucy Jones keeps telling me these very, very interesting stories. In fact, exactly at the same time where a lot of this deep earth stuff was happening in 1974. No, and it was in 1970, 1971, 1972, and 1973. There was a lot of work that was done, even at Caltech, even by Don Anderson, that I only had discovered in this last year about how they could use some sort of anomalies in the wave speeds in P and S to predict some sort of dilatation that was going on. One thing I was familiar with though, and it also feeds into that, uh, in the 1970s and all the ways extending into the early 1980s, there was this thing called the Palmdale bulge also that fed into it. And some of the Caltech graduate students worked on it. And so you know where Palmdale is. But uh, based upon some work that US, I believe USGS scientists were doing, are you familiar with this work? I am, yes. Yeah, so they were, maybe Tom Heaton talked to you about it, but in any event, they used these two color um, light beams and to try to see, and they thought actually near the San Andreas Fault that the earth was being tilted one way or another. And eventually this guy, David Jackson, who became a very prominent graduate of Caltech and professor at UCLA, uh, long since retired, uh, was the real person behind that. And then there were several other graduate students. Um, yeah. And in fact, the other interesting thing, and part of the reason why this came up with Lucy Jones, is we're doing this public thing for the centennial called Shaking in Your Seats. It's a big outreach event that Caltech is going to, uh, public, uh, you know, popular thing um that we're going to do with movies and stuff like that but we discovered that some of the comments that were made in this 1974 movie called earthquake did you watch that movie yeah i've seen it <laughs> okay there you go we'll watch it again because of course they're caltech graduate students in there okay. as a caltech direct seismolab director blah 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 but literally it's sort of in an indirect way hints towards this idea of the the wave speeds in P and S. I think it was in that one. Yeah. And and so, yeah, but actually it's interesting. A lot of it just, um, it's part of the Seismolab histories. In fact, you, if did you talk with Bob Geller? I did. Oh, well, there you get it from him. Straight from the source. There you go. I think he co-authored or authored these papers. But that's the funny thing is, you know, Bob, you know, he's a, you know, a lot of people are, you know, he's a he's a smart guy. And, um, you know, when he worked on earthquake prediction, but then he became the biggest thorn in the side for the Japanese, right? Yep. Um, because he was so, 
you know, okay, earthquake prediction, absolutely something that we should strive for, if I understand him correctly. But yet, on the other hand, it has to be put on a fundamental science basis. And you can prove everything in a fundamental level, then you can take it to the next level. And he, I believe his concern was that he couldn't, a lot of the work never panned out, and so he couldn't put it on a fundamental basis. And so all the other stuff that we're doing about earthquakes is just, you know, there's nothing fundamental about earthquake prediction. So in any event, I think uh, I am not, I was not, I was clueless about that. In fact, the other, this is the interesting thing. So a lot of my, a lot of my work over the years came from a lot of the, the structural discoveries that were made, structural images of the structure of the earth that came out of the Seismolab. But then the other thing that had a real, the, the redirection that I took in my own science is when I arrived in the Seismolab, again, I was nominally supposed to be connected with this Caltech Hypercube project after the parallel computers got discovered at Caltech. And I was gonna run the computer codes and write the software for these computers. Um, but, you know, in parallel, you know, I was gonna put tectonic plates into convection models, which really hadn't been done up to that point. And, uh, but as I was thinking about all of this, right, and I didn't yet do this when I was a graduate, when I was a postdoc here, but I did it when I was an assistant professor with a graduate student, but it all came out of just, you know, sitting there in coffee, listening about earthquakes, and then reading Hiro Kanemori's papers about great earthquakes. And then I would be simultaneously reading these papers about mantle convection. Well, they're totally on different topics and different ways of approaching problems. And then I decided that I needed to bring them together, right? And that was what I did. Um, that was one of the accomplishments I've made as a truly independent scientist uh, and as an assistant professor at the University of Michigan. But, um, but yeah, so, but yeah, I mean, the Seismolab and the students and all the work they did subsequently of being around the country and around the world played a huge role in my thinking, yeah. Mike, when, when you were thinking about postdocs, was, was Caltech the be all and end all? Is that really where you wanted to be? No, um, I, again, I was actually, I actually was, um, um, there was like, competing competing ideas that were working in my head and he and it turns out there was um three of them three competing ideas one from a from an earth science perspective and from an into okay from a geophysics perspective and the, the perspective of the interior of the earth i wanted to come to the seismolab I wanted because of its intellectual atmosphere. And mostly that was just personal people interacting with me at the ANU telling me about Caltech, right? And then I all I spent most of my time reading papers by people from Caltech. So obviously I wanted to come here. But there turns out there was two other intellectual threats that played a big role in my thinking at the time. At this time, um, the need for supercomputing in the early, in the mid eighties now had just exploded, right? The whole big debate about how do you get access to the fastest computers in the world if you're not building an atomic weapon, right? And so I wanted access to the most, to the fastest computers in the world. I wanted to be involved with teams that were involved with this work. And I didn't know what to do. So in addition to writing to Caltech, I also was um, pursuing the possibility of going to Los Alamos. Um, and I could have gone probably through linkages up with um, this guy. His name was Jerry Schubert at UCLA. Had started to develop very strong linkages with Los Alamos. Um, but at the time, in hindsight, I'm glad this happened. 
but I only narrowed I only narrowed my site so I only they only had like one open they only had several open fellowships like the Oppenheimer fellowship and stuff like that and um and those things are very competitive right I mean there's hundreds and hundreds and thousands of physicists competing for these things right and uh so in hindsight luckily I didn't get it right now so that and so but I was still really really worried about this connection with the supercomputing so we had the intellectual one no the geophysics intellectual one then there was the 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 part of supercomputing but then it turns out there was a third intellectual thread and that was plate tectonics right and that's ultimately one of the big things I did as a scientist was merge the observational basis of plate tectonics in with a theoretical one. But I read in the library at the ANU, well, first of all, I was reading all these papers from this other place called Lamont at Columbia University, right? Lamont Doherty. I think we've talked about this because we were talking about science on a mission, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so any event, I was reading all these papers and then I read, it was actually a New Yorker article, but someone, a librarian or whatever, had photographed this article, this like four page, four issue article in the New Yorker and then put it in a binder, and put it in the library and then the first person to read it was me, probably, and an event. Um, and it was about this guy called Doc Ewing, right? And he was this ocean, he was a seismologist at uh, Lamont, and he built Lamont. He made Lamont. Um, and, uh, but the, but a, a totally different story was portrayed in this article, right? Then, then that sort of came out actually in the science on a mission. In the, I mean, it was just all about science and about this really hardworking, driven scientist, Doc Ewing, would take these boats around the world and make all these measurements and make all these and assemble all of this data. And um, I was just, you know, that. You know, I was, and then the, and the other weird thing I was doing at this time, besides reading all of these papers, I actually was reading all these books about sailing, exploration, and and I said, oh man, maybe I want to go to Lamont, right? And um, and then so I also applied for Lamont, right? And uh, and interestingly enough, and people would later say, Michael, why didn't you come to Lamont? And then I say, well, I applied and you rejected. Oh, you were rejected. How could you ever be rejected? And uh, well, I realized in hindsight is because in the year, the same year, the year before, they gave this fellowship to literally a person in my same field, right? So a person who did computer modeling and uh, so, and um, so they weren't going to give it to him with the person in the same field. And and I had no, I only did computer modeling. I had no basis for making a measurement, right? So I was a little bit disappointed, but then I got into, got, but they wanted me to come to Caltech and they wanted me. This guy, Brad Hager, um, I remember I was meeting him at the AGU and he literally comes up to me. I want you to come to Caltech. You got to come to Caltech. I was, oh boy. <laughs> and uh, I said, whoa, I gotta go. Because he he was a, a person I looked up to enormously. And he uh, he's just a little bit older than I am, but was making great breakthroughs at the time and left for MIT shortly thereafter. But in any event, um, so yeah, so I you know, and a lot of other places offered me jobs and stuff like that, um, and a lot of people wanted me. And, but it was Caltech, yeah. I mean, this is I had just done enough reading and oh, oh yeah, then. What no, year? I didn't finish it. Yeah, uh, there was the other one. I didn't. But what about the computing? So that really scared the dickens out of me, right? And it was all this commentary in the pages of Science Magazine about academic scientists don't have any access to this computing and blah 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 blah. And what are we supposed to do? And maybe NSF is gonna 
do something. NSF is trying to get the their own supercomputers that are not connected to Los Alamos up. And uh, but because I was they they just discovered the parallel computer and it was going to revolutionize computing and it was at Caltech and I could be involved. Suddenly, two of those three pieces came together and I said, oh, I could go to Caltech. And uh, then I then it was just it was just no. I mean, you know, it was to me as it as this unfolded, it became. Uh, no question where, what I would needed to do. Mike, tell me specifically what was so revolutionary about parallel computing for you at that time? Well, I mean, already, I mean, I, because I was a person who thought with numerical methods, we did the finite difference method at the time. People still widely use that method to solve partial differential equations. But the whole basis for these numerical methods are to imagine physical space now is is brought up into a whole bunch of smaller pieces. And so the whole idea is that you can now with hardware represent the physical situation. Now you have a big computer in different parts of the part are in different parts of the computing domain, right? And on different computers compute simultaneously. I got to show you something. It, it played such a huge role for me. I, one of my first pictures I made when I was at Caltech um, back in the mid 1980s uh, was this, I'm going to get you this picture. And it's just a camera home this point. I was so possessed by it. Oh man, this is the prime. Oh, I found it. So these show you some pictures that came Please. out in the same year. So this calculation can be done, you know, on my iPhone in about a billionth of a second. <laughs> no, I don't know what it can be done. But I this was done. This was the first convection. This was the first geophysics calculation that was done on a parallel computer. And uh, it's just thermal convection, right? Hot upwelling. Right and cold downwelling. Right, Mike. We're on audio, so I wonder if you could narrate a little bit what we're looking at. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? No, no. I mean, just for the audio recording, listeners are not going to be able to see what you're showing me right now. So I wonder if you can narrate a little bit what it is that we're seeing. So what we're looking at right now, here, is a uh, is a picture of thermal convection, and so we have. Yellow is hot, and you see along the bottom there's a yellow thermal bond. Whoops, there's a yellow thermal boundary layer, and uh, and then on the top there's this blue cold thermal boundary layer. And so this is your cartoon view of normal thermal convection, in which this goes up, comes around, and goes back down. So all but at a very at a much finer scale, with the numerical method, there's a grid. And the equations of physics, of, of conservation of momentum and conservation of energy are solved on this very fine grid. But then it turns out that 
This was literally done. I'm going to count these pictures. One, two, three, four. On a 32 processor computer that was built here at Caltech. And each one of these little squares, that was done on one computer, right? And that was done on a different computer. And that was done on a different computer. And these, they weren't done, they were all on the same, this is one computer, but these were done on different processors, right? Literally different chips. And they literally, they were, you know, uh, you know, you know, it was just the same chips that were in the first IBM PC. And there was, um, and it was, the computing was done, this was on one processor, and then it communicated with this processor and it communicated with this, right? And so I even made pictures like this, and I, you know, this is a time dependence to watch a classical problem here, convective instability here, it's going convectively unstable, and then at a different time, it gets overshoots, and then we reach steady state convection. But this is why I was so possessed by parallel computing. And I was the only one in geo, one of few people in geophysics who was doing this. And then I was the only one in my field for at least a long, long time because this was actually not that state of the art, this calculation. And I did a little bit bigger calculations that weren't so big, but I demonstrated that it could be done, right? And it turns out that there's lots of applied math problems why this didn't, didn't work very well either. But in the same year I did that, I did these calculations. So they're on science. Can you see, is that, oh, that's inverted, isn't it? No, so no, I can see, see it. it. I can see it, science news. It's, it's. I see it like oh, you see it. Oh, okay. So in any event, so th I did this in the same year. I don't know what year this came out in. 1988, okay, I was doing this as a postdoc, but I did this because after I got to Caltech, what happened is the National Science Foundation um, then built these big supercomputers and they built one down in San Diego and Gulf General Atomics built one down. They, got, they bought one actually from Cray Research and they bought one and I got on the system and uh, we were able to communicate. We put a, um, a dish, of, you know, a radar antenna over at the computing building and we could use, we could communicate actually through an early version of NSFNet, we could communicate with that computer down there. And I could work here in my office and then send jobs down there. But I would then go down to San Diego too and I made made a movie, I made the, one of the first convection movies. Um, and it was on the front page of Science News when we did this on the great computer. So I could do interesting geophysics, but I had to use the NSF supercomputer. And it was the same year, that in a couple of years, when we were building these new algorithms. but it was more like a proof of concept, right? That suddenly, you know, now, you know, we we have, you know, in the last several years, we've gone to just astronomically large number of, of compute nodes. But um, but at the time, it, you know, it was kind of like, uh, I mean, I, I, I bought into it, right? I mean, I read these articles, these news articles and Scientific American articles and, and uh, about what parallel computing could do, right? And then I could imagine it. Um, you know, maybe I could do this at Caltech, and I don't have to be at Los Alamos. So this is the thing I was worried about. Well, Los Alamos was a fascinating place, and uh, there's a long, storied history that you're very familiar with, and most people in physics, and science, should know about it. If they don't know about it, they should know about it. But in any event, um, and. So that was a good thing about coming to Caltech was this intellectual thing, and I thought I could do the, the, uh, the, the computing thing. And so in the end, but through the National Science Foundation, its facilities, and just being clever, I was able to also do some cool geophysics and then some do some pie in the sky stuff that wouldn't have big payoffs until decades later. Mike, when you got to the Seismo Lab as a postdoc, what were some of the big ideas? What were people excited about at that point? Well, uh, I mean, one of the things that people were, there was a lot of arguments about uh, of D double prime, that's the very bottom of the mantle. Um, uh, the, the ultra low velocity zones were, were getting discovered. Um, but, you know, there was a lot of discussion 
I mean, it's just, it was just everything, right? It was about the way earthquakes were working, what earthquakes looked like, what all these layers were like in the mantle. I mean, it was just, it was just, you know, it was just lots and lots. But it was interesting. I almost think in hindsight, there was a period of time in there. And I think it was about this period of time from the, that I would call, and for different reasons, interestingly enough, in that period from about 1990 to about 95 or in that there were eight and it was about the time i left the, the seismo lab it was kind of quiet i could tell it even in my own field um of geodynamics it was like this in seismology and whatnot and and uh and the reason for that is the computing you could with the simple computers you could almost a lot of people did the cool stuff, but then the next, next, they make the next big jump. You need even a bigger, more algorithms, um, more compute power on the one hand. And then from the observational perspective, in terms of seismology, they were deploying all these new seismic networks, but they yet had, they yet hadn't yet been totally crystallized. Like one of the things which is endlessly debating is about, well, what did convection look like inside the mantle from seismology? Forget about it, what the computer models were doing that I was doing. And every, you know, it's just arguments because the seismic tomography, the pictures were, I mean, I think the robust things we were arguing about there ended up being the robust things, right? And while well, the big powerful person at the time, of course, was Don Anderson. Right, and he was director of the Seismo Lab, and uh, and he was Mr. Layered Convection. He was going to absolutely have layered convection no matter what, even though all his students were going to prove, in fact, they were going to have the big. By the mid '90s, it then had come together. So in this period of time, there was lots and lots of debate, but it was lots of just argument because it's just the data just couldn't convince people one way or the other, right, of of what these sort of um, of these structures were sort of were sort of like, right? And the other thing that sort of was a little bit of little friction in the system was the fact that, I mean, just before I came, Hiro Kanamori had just made this big, big sort of uh, intellectual leap on the um, on the nature of great earthquakes, right? And mostly it had to do with his ability to get the magnitude get the mag the moment magnitude scale that didn't saturate, so we could see how big earthquakes were. So there was still, there was a lot of discussion in coffee about the great earthquakes and about whatnot, but yet we hadn't seen any, right? It was all the debate about all these older earthquakes and we're deploying all these seismometers around the world, the global, the GSN, the global seismic network had started to be put in. These were the, these were these very expensive broadband instruments that they were putting in around the world. They weren't putting them in locally, like here in California or anywhere around the world. They just to see what mantle convection looked like and what the distribution of earthquake, big earthquakes looked like. And because, well, we didn't have any great earthquakes, nothing, absolutely like Zippo, the earth went quiet. So this is the best way to stop an earthquake is give geophysicists a lot of money to put instruments in and the earth, the, the earth will just quiet up, it just shuts up. And this has happened. Sorry, I know this is a joke, of course. You realize that, <laughs> tongue in cheek. Um, it's just statistics of small numbers. That's just the way it is. And, uh, you know, when we had put these big observational system in and just like pfft, nothing, right? And that's why I think we ended our other conversation last time. I said that we had just finished up going through a golden age of earthquake science, right? And that golden age of earthquake science sort of started uh like in the late aughts like you know i don't know aught seven or whatever and that's then the earth lit up again right with great earthquakes but then we had these great things but of course we had already figured out what the depth of mantle convection is by that time or at least we knew it wasn't upper mantle convection anymore those came in by the mid 90s the global seismic network had resolved and so yeah, it's quite interesting. Things definitely go up and down. Things get really exciting for a while. New instruments go up there. Sometimes there's a little bit of friction in the system because the data's not there yet. And then all of a sudden, you know, things explode, paradigm shifts. But uh, 
So, um, but yeah, at that time, I mean, it was, um, it was basically a lot of arguing in the Seismo Lab. That I would argue with Don Anderson and about the depth of mantle convection and what the seismic images showed. Um, we were discussing, but probably not arguing about what any of this fine scale structure was like. Um, that, and we then started to, that those more debates then started up, heated up several more years later when the observations became better. But yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I don't know if I answered your question. Mike, you know, hearing the stories about the old Seismo Lab up in the hills, we talked a little bit about this last time. When you joined as a postdoc, was it still a place where, you know, it would attract the top people in the field and there was proprietary data that drew people to the Seismo Lab because, you know, databases and obviously the internet simply wasn't around yet? Absolutely. I mean, if you wanted to do, well, that's actually really quite interesting. Um, I mean, I think that the size, at that time when I came, uh, in terms of data sets, um, I think the draw was just the people. It was the people, right? And um, yeah, so I, I think, I think, I think, um, but it is interesting. I mean, it comes and goes, right, about the draw of the seismic lab because it's really quite interesting. You know, the reason why Zach Ross, you know, have you, he's a young guy. He's the youngest of the I'm youngest. very excited to speak with him. Okay, because you've seen a lot of the stuff. Oh, yeah. But interestingly enough, when we brought him in as a postdoc, I mean, we actually didn't have to, like, recruit him. He <laughs> wanted to charge here because he had this vision of he, because he, even though he could get the data on the internet, right? By being here, because the date, because we didn't understand what he was up to, right? No way did we understand what he was up to. But I think he wanted to come here because he would be here with the data itself. Yeah. Right? Um, and so, but it comes and goes. Like the big thing that played a really important role for me scientifically was this network called the Global Seismic Network, which the NSF IRIS the Incorporated Research Seismology Institute and the Institutes for Seismology put in, IRIS. And uh, and that of course you could get anyone could get that data, right? Um, and uh, but actually interestingly enough, up until before that came online, you know, and it became really easy to starting to get the data like by the the later nineteen nineties, right? By the late nineteen nineties, then you could sort of get that. But by the mid by the mid '90s, no, you still somehow had to order magnetic tapes through the mail. Uh, but before that, actually, the way a lot of seismologists did their work, global seismologists, there was a previous network. It was called WWSSN, the Worldwide, or is it WWSN or WWSSN? I forget. Anyways, one or the other. I'm not a seismologist. I forget. Um, but in any event, all of this data existed only on microfiche chips. And there was just three open places in the in the country. One was here in the Seismo Lab, the other one was Lamont, and then there was somewhere else. And uh, of course, a lot of people are PO'd at the Seismo Lab because we got rid of ours, but that's their problem. It wasn't a unique data set. No one was using it anymore, and the people who used it said we should get rid of it, so I don't know what to do. But sorry. <laughs> but in any event, uh, so it comes and goes if you've got a unique um, thing on the on the data or not, right? Um, yeah, and so we've talked about this before. I mean, the places like Caltech and the Seismo Lab, you know, you know, we, you know, the whole internet has been, you know, works against some of the things that 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 make us right. There's all this openness of science, and uh, being able to just freely move information around, you know, then you you lose the 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 proprietariness of certain you know inside groups where you get these uh these things where science can really you know unfold in in ways that are quite transformative by a small group of people um and uh, as a historian of science i'm sure this is one of the big things that yeah, you see that's right um mike yeah. being at the side i hate this i hate the size i i hate the internet by the way <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> like being being at the at the seismolab as a postdoc relative to the other positions you were considering that might have been more broadly geophysical based did you get more involved in earthquakes simply as a result of being here than you might otherwise have been yeah i think just listening to people it's just amazing i mean i you know i just i just developed an appreciation like i would never have right i mean it's just it's just uh, by osmosis right i mean it was just that's it you know and that's why well, by the time i left i was determined to make mantle convection models i mean mechanically get closer to earthquakes right um i mean that's why my first one of my first big accomplishments with a student was to put faults in and all my information was false was coming from earthquake seismologists it wasn't coming from geodynamics it was coming from earthquakes and i said that's what i want um and so uh yeah and and, and it would have been you know the the way you your science unfolds is definitely how the the people around you how they look at problems right um and yeah i just have just developed this appreciation of the perspective of my colleagues and what they've accomplished and despite you know people not liking a lot of the stuff that comes out of caltech or some of the people from here i say so what i don't care um i i, I just you know Maybe it's brainwashing. Maybe it's nothing. As a historian, there's nothing unique what I'm saying here, but it's um, but it's definitely the way my science is. But mine is my my science is not even close. My science is not even close to a cookie cutter of what other people in the lab ever did. Right? I mean, I haven't even really talked about what I consider to be my most important scientific contributions, which are more on the geology side of things and sea level change and long-term evolution, which I think is, um, which is my most important scientific contributions. But that's, um, but in, in so the Seismolab really didn't, only played it in a small role there. I mean, when I was finishing up my postdoc here, when I wasn't working on these sea level problems and whatnot, it was Don Anderson who steered me in the direction. I was already gonna go in this direction anyways. And I was already doing reading and, but he sent some papers to me. He says, Mike, you gotta look at these papers, man. And it was just like, holy smokes. I can't believe what Don gave me here. <laughs> and, um, and that played a huge role. So, um, Mike, yeah. which faculty were most important to you at the Seismo lab during your postdoc? Well, um, well, my mentor was Brad Hager. He, was clearly played a huge role. Um, I think the interestingly enough, the role that um, Brad played was one of computational rigor, interestingly enough. Uh, the, the, the field overall, you know, okay, we you know we get the we get the equations, we think we're smart, we write a computer program, we solve them, you know, this is the answer. Um, but Brad had a, was really, pushed me in the direction that, you know, the way he would interact with other people in the seismic lab. I mean, it was way more intense here. I mean, just, just, just like the intensity level here was way higher. The self-criticism was way higher here, and uh, and just a lot of self-criticism about the numerics and the quality of your solutions and stuff like that. And uh, he instilled in me a huge, you know, huge perspective in this in this regard. In hindsight, Hiro Kanamori had a huge influence on me as a postdoc, but I didn't realize it yet. And it had all to do with just what the connecting up geodynamics to great earthquakes and reading his papers um, played a huge role in listening to him and, and just watching the way these guys work played a huge role. They were all geophysicists now, instead of being um, 
theoreticians, even though they were the they were the best and they were just as good as anyone else in this whole area of using physics and computing and math. But it was all about what the earth was saying too, right? And this is totally empirical, right? And so the simultaneity of, of getting both, you know, you just, because sometimes you go and you'll find people and they're so narrow. And I think I mentioned this to you before, how I annoyed so many people in my field because they were so good at running all these computer models and endlessly making pretty pictures. And then I'm telling them that, well, the earth does that. What do you say? <laughs> and what in the seismic lab, it was always first the data and then what does it mean, right? But yet they were from people who also was interested in making sure that the physics was right, right? And so that's that, I mean, suddenly the bar is just so high, you know, and I learned that bar here, right? That simultaneously bar and the people were tough and competitive and, uh, but highly interactive and, and also generous at the same time. It, it, it just was, it was, was an amazing time. I mean, yeah, even though I didn't do the same research that everyone else in the lab did, right? It's, but that was okay. I mean, it, they had a huge impact on me. Um, and that definitely, you know, in some ways that my science unfolded, it had a big impact. And then so I, I think Don Anderson, but Don Anderson in a contrarian way had a huge impact, right? I mean, every day, you know, having to go spar with him in coffee and cartoons on the board and with this observation, he, he knew everything. I was just like, I mean, some days it had to be really quiet because I didn't even know anywhere close to what he knew. Um, and at the time, Don Anderson, uh, Don Helmberger had zero impact on me personally in, in working with him. His papers did and his students' papers did, but he didn't, right? That was only when I came back as a faculty member. Then he became the closest one, right? Of course, by that time, Anderson had sort of moved, had become... You know, he was already as incredibly famous at the time, but then, um, you know, I think his pr most productive phase had it, had already passed by the time I came back, right? Um, Mike, for our next talk, we'll pick up on the opportunities you considered after your postdoc. Last question for today. Was it discussed at all about you ultimately getting a faculty position at Caltech during your no, postdoc? No, because, no, because... Actually, at the time, they didn't need me because Brad Hager was here, right? But it only happened like almost immediately after I left. So it didn't happen at Caltech. In <laughs> fact, the only discussion we ever had here had nothing to do with Caltech. It had to do with MIT, uh -huh. right? Because then Brad Hager came to me. He was my mentor, is my postdoc advisor. And uh, he says, I know you're interviewing at MIT, but just so you know, um, I'm very supportive of it, of you, Mike, but I'm also, they're also looking at me too. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> and then, so actually, unfortunately, and, and, uh, and I am so happy this worked out the way it did. Oh my God. Because, um, you know, I visited MIT a whole bunch of times and then in the end they decided to hire Brad because what they did for Brad became very famous right at the same time. And, uh, and they, they Cal, there was some tension in the division and MIT took advantage of that and they got him a chair. Uh, I had discussed this with this very famous Seismo Lab graduate, M. Nafi Tokso. Yeah. He's passed away, but he was a student, I think, I don't know if he's a, I think it was a, a Frank Press and along with Don Anderson. And he took me aside at MIT and, and you know, he says, oh boy, I mean, I think we're gonna try to hire you because it's gonna be really hard to hire Brad because we're gonna have to give him a name chair and blah, blah. But then everyone was such a jerk to me at MIT. It was like, holy mackerel, who are all these jerks? Everyone was. All the other universities I visited, they're all working hard to be nice to me, even at Caltech. 
and they go to MIT and they're all jerks. Like, and that was away. next stop after the postdoc? No, I went to the University of Michigan. Oh boy, were they nice to me there. There's a whole cadre of Caltech people there. Perfect. And they knew I was here and they met me when I was here and they immediately latched on to me. But then, you know, so, but no, they worked, they worked the hardest and okay. they, they got me. That's perfect. But no, MIT in the end never came around because MIT went for Brad. They didn't go to me. But then, then they opened up a position at Caltech and then, then it switched. Then they had to figure out who to hire. There was a bunch of high flying people. It was Brad and two, a couple other people and myself were all the big high flyers in, geod in geodynamics. And so then they had to figure out, well, they lost Brad and then they got to figure out who to hire. And then, uh, well, I figured out things not from Caltech, but from other people. But, but in any event, yeah. So yeah, that was interesting, but Mike, who knows we'll if, pick up, if any of it's true. We'll pick up for next time. The opportunity. Oh my gosh. I didn't know it was going to be.